Hey everybody, so the weather here currently sucks. We've had a string of record low temperatures and everything is completely frozen. And in fact, even with the space heater in my shop, I can't even get it above freezing. So that means my operations there are going to be shut down for the time being. So today I'm going to show you a simple at home project where I build a laser out of thin air. Oh yeah, don't try this at home or whatever. Now when you think of the very simplest laser designs, you think of some sort of lazy medium that's surrounded by two mirrors. Now this lazy medium can be pretty much anything, a solid, liquid, gas, plasma, anything you really want it to be as long as you pump it hard enough. And then you put those two mirrors on the end so the light can bounce back and forth and achieve optical amplification. But in a few rare instances, the gain is so high through the cavity that you don't even need mirrors. And this effect is called superluminescence. And in fact, one of these special materials that exhibits this phenomenon is just regular old air. Now in the case of a simple air laser, the actual species that's doing the lasing is uh, diatomic nitrogen of which air is 78%. Now in order to build a nitrogen laser, there actually are some obstacles that you have to overcome, but it is completely doable at home. Here's a simplified model of the nitrogen laser system. So you start by blasting uh, the ground state with high energy electrons, and you excite to this state, which is the laser state. Then from there it drops down to this state and emits UV photons. Now the two big parameters on here are the lifetime of this laser state and the lifetime of this state. Now, unfortunately, the lifetime of this state is many, many, many times longer than this. And it has to fall back down to the ground state before you can excite it again. And that means that uh, because this one is so long, this prevents you from operating this in continuous mode. So you can pretty much only build this as a pulse laser. Then to make matters worse, the lifetime of this state is really short. It's two, around two and a half billionths of a second. So that means you have to build a circuit that can fire that quickly. And although it sounds difficult, this is actually doable with household materials. Here's the classic nitrogen laser circuit. It's actually a very simple circuit. It's just a couple capacitors, a uh, inductor, and a couple spark gaps. Then of course a uh, charging circuit. Now the uh, trickiest part of the build is uh, in these capacitors because they have to fire in under two and a half nanoseconds. And that's extremely tricky to do with off-the-shelf components. Now just to give you an idea on how fast that is, two and a half nanoseconds is to a second is about one second is to a human lifetime. So that's a very, very fast pulse. Now this is hard to do with just off-the-shelf capacitors, but it's actually surprisingly easy to with a little bit of aluminum foil and plastic wrap. Alright, on to the actual laser construction. So I started by laying down a sheet of aluminum foil, and then on top of that I put a sheet of polyethylene plastic. Now I did my best to keep everything as flat as possible in order to maximize uh, the capacitance. And then from there I put two sheets of aluminum foil on top, which gives me my two capacitors, and then I used two pieces of angle aluminum as my laser electrodes. And then for a spark gap, I just used a chunk of metal and some coins, and then finally I built an inductor by just making a coil of wire. And then I hooked it up to my charging circuit. After some careful alignment of the spark gap and the laser electrodes, I was able to get some output. This spark gap is what sets the voltage on the capacitors before the laser fires. So as the voltage rises, uh, it eventually hits a point where the air between the uh, spark gap breaks down and allows the uh, laser to fire. So if the gap is too small, the capacitors don't get to very high voltage and there's not enough energy to uh, excite the nitrogen molecules. But if you make the spark gap too long, then the voltage rises too high, and then you get dielectric breakdown in your capacitor. Then the whole thing goes toast, and you have to rebuild it from scratch. And yes, I've had to do that many times. Well, sh I used very fine grit sandpaper to make sure that the edges of the electrodes are very, very smooth. That way, how to get uniform excitation along the cavity. And now because there's no mirrors on this laser, you actually get output on both sides. But in fact, one of those sides is going to be favored a little bit more than the other, just depending on how those electrodes are oriented. For my charging circuit, I just used a flyback transformer hooked up to a zero voltage switching driver. But in reality, you could use a lot of other high voltage DC sources, even just a simple static generator. And in fact, because of this, this is actually a design that could have uh, been built 200 years ago. Which is hilarious because the first laser wasn't built till 1960, and even at that time there was debate on whether a laser could actually be built. But here's a very simple design for a laser that could have been built way, way, way before the first ruby laser was ever fired. So that's pretty cool. Here's a little bag of phosphorescent powder. And now, as you can tell, the average power isn't that high, because just a simple uh, Blu-ray laser pointer would make it glow brighter. But that being said, the peak power is actually surprisingly high. In fact, we can do a little calculation here. 
Now my capacitors store a little bit over a joule and dump that in a little over a nanosecond. And that gives me a peak input power of about a billion watts. So that's a crazy amount of power. Now looking at the laser, assuming an efficiency of about 0.1%, which is probably a little generous, that gives me a peak output power of about a megawatt. So this is technically the most powerful laser that I've ever built, although it doesn't have nearly enough average power to burn anything, but it's still pretty remarkable. Now before I end this video, I want to let you all know that I'm going to be at the Photonics West Conference in San Francisco on January 31st, and I'm going to be with uh, ESCO Optics in booth 4244, so you all should definitely visit me there. And yeah, until the next time, stay safe and happy lazing.